Just to give me a sense of who's in the room, how many of you have lived in Montana more than five years? More than 10 years, keep your hands up. More than 15 years, more than 20 years, more than 25 years, more than 30 years, more than 35 years, more than 40 years. Right on, give yourselves a round of applause. That's why you're in the room. That is amazing, truly amazing, especially coming from a state like Arizona. For those of you who don't know anything about Arizona, two thirds of us came from somewhere else. Uh, we have a very rapid uh, growth uh, thing happening in Arizona. Uh, when my family landed uh, in the Phoenix area in 1968, the, the little suburb where I grew up had about 13,000 people in it. Today it's 185,000 people. Uh, and that's just part of Phoenix. And you may not even realize that uh, Greater Phoenix right now is about 4, 425, 4, 4.25 million people. So we're the sixth largest city in the country and we just continue to rapidly grow. So I'm sharing this with you because it really got me thinking about connection to place. We landed in Arizona when I was nine months old and uh, with this rapid growth that occurred and this rapid exodus was also occurring, um, I started thinking about, gosh, why are we losing so many of our bright young people? So just a little bit about my background. I uh, started a music store in 1987. So it became a community hub. So we had records and CDs, we did live music, we had a wide variety of things happening in that store. Uh, and, it, and it was really like bookstores and record stores are kind of a community hub. And I kept watching all of my bright young people leave and they would go and do something great in somebody else's town. And I started to get a little competitive about that. And I started thinking, Gosh, why is it that I want to stay here and do something great and, and, they, and they're just rushing to get out of here? So that got me thinking about connection to place. And that's what my talk uh, is going to be about today is connection to place and the relationship between the built environment and the way you feel about your communities and all of those things that come with building great places. And some of us probably don't think about it uh, that much anymore. But to start, I'm going to get you thinking about the built environment. So before I even start, I want you to just spend a minute and visualize your favorite community. Could be a city, could be a town, something where there's livability. I want you to envision that. Some people come up with a tree-lined street, maybe there's some window shopping. Some people come up with uh, you know, old buildings next to new buildings, maybe it's more rural, maybe it's more urban, but think about that spot and hold on to it for a minute because we're going to come back to it. Okay, just think about what that place looks like, how it makes you feel, and what, what you love about it. Why did your mind go right to it? Okay, so I'm going to start in this place. What just happened there? So I'm going to start in this place where um, in Phoenix, we have a ton of people from Illinois, like a ton. So it's pretty common for us as Phoenicians to listen to people talk about how great Chicago is. They go on and on and on. And if the Cubs are ever in Phoenix, there's more people at the game playing against the Diamondbacks that are there to cheer on the Cubs. I mean, think about it. The Cubs could lose for 100 years straight and not lose a single fan, right? <laughs> they have more hometown pride than anyone. They do. I mean, how, how is it that people just continue to love Chicago that much? Now, it's a great town. Don't get me wrong. I love Chicago. But think about this. I was standing, this is a true story. I was standing in line, just chit-chatting with a woman, just a stranger to me. We're just chit-chatting. And she starts telling me how great Chicago is. You know, I'm thinking, all right, I'm an Arizona girl. I've heard it all before, heard it all before. And then at one point, she kind of leaned in as if kind of confidentially, and she said to me, boy, you guys sure have made a mess out here in Arizona. <laughs> and in my mind, I thought, oh, you guys. Uh, you know, I was kind of you know, taken aback by that. But I said, you guys, I said, you don't live here. She said, no, I live here. I said, oh, well, you haven't lived here very long then. And she said, no, I've lived here 15 years. I said, so who the heck is you guys? <laughs> you live here now. You are an Arizonan, whatever mess we made, you made part of it, right? Think about that. She was so disconnected from her place that she was still counting herself as somebody from Chicago. 
It's not my problem. You got a problem with education out here? What do you want me to do about it? I just got here 15 years ago. <laughs> wow! This was really eye-opening to me, super eye-opening. So I started doing my little independent survey of everyone I could find from Chicago. I just went high and low, which actually, I shouldn't say high and low, you just walk down the street in Arizona and you bump into somebody from Chicago. But I found everybody I couldn't interview. I asked them why they love Chicago so much. And my smile grew bigger and bigger and bigger because my hunch was right. And they told me in a million ways and in a million voices, they told me the locally owned businesses. Think about it. The first thing they said, chefs and restaurants. I love the food scene in Chicago. Then they said in the neighborhood where I used to live, I knew all of the business owners. They used to say things like, you know, they'd walk in the door and they'd know what I want. Oh, you want the regular today? They'd say things to me like, you know, Kimber, when I was in Chicago, we had these great little streets and I used to just stroll after work. Wasn't in a rush at all, tree-lined streets. They said things like, in Chicago, I had the same barber for 40 years. Or, growing up in Chicago, we banked at the same bank my great-grandparents banked at. I feel rooted to that community. Now, what's interesting about Phoenix, Arizona is that we mostly grew up after the invention of the chain store, okay? Certainly after the invention of the automobile. So you could take that same person who is behaving in what I would call a localized manner, move them to Phoenix, Arizona, and they're eating at Applebee's and they're shopping at Target and they're wondering why they don't feel connected. I'm not criticizing those businesses. I'm simply saying you have the same experience no matter where you are. I could get on a plane tomorrow and fly to Chicago and eat my breakfast at Denny's and my lunch at Applebee's and my dinner at Chili's and hit a Target and a Lowe's and a Kohl's in the afternoon and I could kind of shrug my shoulders and go, huh, I don't get it. Why do people love Chicago so much? It's kind of like the same as everywhere else, right? So that got me thinking. And so with Local First Arizona, we are a coalition of locally owned businesses. And a lot of people see that and they think, oh, like a chamber. Ah. We're not, we're a movement. Chambers are important. We're different than a chamber. We're not just a coalition. We are trying to better connect people to place. So thinking about that, and that hunch that I had so long ago, the Knight Foundation issued a study just a couple of years ago. I highly recommend it, that you read it, because it demonstrates that Connection to place is the single most leading indicator in places that have prosperity. And then when people love their place, they're more likely to vote, they're more likely to volunteer, to give charitably. They're even more likely to pay their taxes without complaining because they love their place and they want to contribute to it. Think about how important it is that your hometown maintain its authenticity, maintain that character that makes people feel connected. So I'm going to talk about how your built environment leads itself to whether or not you have those kinds of places that make people feel connected. But first I'm going to teach you how dollars move through the economy. Now, a lot of times, even several times this morning, we've heard about the, the ripple effect or the multiplier effect or job creation, but we don't really understand what that means. And I'm going to give you a way to visualize dollars moving through the economy. So on the one side of your screen here right now, you've got 15 Starbucks logos representing 15 Starbucks locations. And on the other side of your screen, you've got 15 independent coffee shops. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to name the fact that Starbucks is a good company. They absolutely are. So don't mistakenly think that I'm picking on Starbucks. I'm not. Starbucks pays for the health care of their employees. We all hear about that, right? How many of you know that a company like Staples, Staples has 65% of their employees with no health care benefits? 65%. Okay, so who's paying for the health care of their employees again? Remind me. Oh, we are. So wait, those cheaper prices aren't quite so cheap, are they? You've got to measure the real value. 
So I always, you know, get people thinking in my little record store, I'll say, oh, who loves music? Who loves music? Find somebody that really loves music, and I'll say, I'll give you a deal forevermore. I'm going to guess you. I'm going to, forevermore, you have 50% off in my store. All you got to do is pick up the health care for my employees. <laughs> do we got a deal? Oh, dang. But we do this all the time. Shoot, we do this all the time. And then there's the conversation around subsidies, right? Starbucks isn't the business of subsidies. You know Cabela's stores? Do you guys know Cabela's averages $35 million in subsidies before they open a store? $35 million? The one in Arizona got $68 million for a retail location. Oh, Bass Pro got $32 million in my home state. Walmart's averaged 25 to $30 million per store. Gosh, those cheaper prices, whew, they're costing us a fortune. Right? we got to measure the true value. What is the cost of those cheap prices? So again, coming back to Starbucks, I'm going to name. Starbucks pays for the health care of their employees. Thank you very much. Most chains do not. Starbucks is not in the business of subsidies. They pay their own way. Great company. They really are. But now we're going to talk about why they're not sustainable for communities like mine and yours. So you spend your money on a latte at Starbucks over here on the one side of the screen. Talk to me about the cost of doing business. Talk to me about, okay, Starbucks has to have an accountant, right? Who's their accounting firm? Do they hire accountants here in Montana? Oh, no, they don't, do they? How about graphic designers? Do they come here and say, you know, we want a fresh logo just for you, Montana? <laughs> How about website developers? Payroll service providers? Accountants, lawyers, you get my drift, right? It's a long list of jobs, and they're called secondary jobs, and you're never going to read about them in the paper, right? You'll never read about them in the paper. Now, look on the other side of your screen. You've got 15 accountants have a client, 15 website developers have a gig, 15 uh, graphic designers, payroll service providers, whatever you want to measure significantly higher on the other side of the screen. Those are dollars recirculating through your economy and they represent opportunity for everyone. Okay, now at this point in my talk a few weeks ago, I had a woman smack herself in the forehead. <laughs> it was the darndest thing. I was like, are you okay? She goes, whack! I was speaking to a room full of graphic designers and she said, yeah, she said, I'm fine, but I used to have seven employees and today I have five and I'm about ready to go down to four. And it never occurred to me until right now that I've been spending all of my money with companies that will never hire me. That is how disconnected we've become from how the economy works. And she said, I better get out there and start buying from other local companies that might actually need a graphic designer, right? So now let's talk about the third time the dollar moves through the economy when you've got the janitorial supply company that keeps the offices clean of the accounting firm, and the accounting firm is only here because the local businesses hire them. It's important that we understand that local business creates those secondary and tertiary job opportunities. It's the ecosystem of jobs. I'm not talking about the baristas. I'm talking about all the other jobs that come with local ownership and building prosperity for all within a community. Now, there's invariably somebody that's thinking, oh my gosh, she doesn't understand economy of scale, how embarrassing, she slept through government and free enterprise. <laughs> now, it is not cheaper to buy a latte at Starbucks, is it? Where's my economy of scale? Now, one last point on this before I move on. Let's blow this model up on Starbucks side. And let's say we've got 30,000 Starbucks locations all across the U.S. of A. They're still only going to have one accountant. And they have one graphic designer who, by the way, probably has his feet on the desk right now because they ain't going to update that logo anytime soon. They've got one payroll service provider. So we've done this to ourselves over and over and over again. And we go out across the country and we spend our money at chain stores, regardless of whether or not they're paying for their health care. Most aren't. Regardless of whether or not they're asking for subsidies, most do. 
and we can prove that for every two jobs they create, three jobs are lost. This is not economic development, and this is not the way we build great places with opportunity for the next generation. We, the beauty is that we can change this. It's totally up to us. The way we spend our money really makes a huge difference, okay? This new study just came out. We know that independent businesses, you spend $10 million, we collectively as Americans, $10 million at independent retails, you create and sustain 110 jobs. The same 10 million bucks spent in chain stores, you get 50 jobs. Now, we've known this now for 10, 12 years since those first studies started coming out going, hey, wait a minute, this model does not work for America, right? Look at that new number. You spend $10 million on Amazon, you get 14 jobs. Now, we've got some tough decisions to make as a country. Because I have to go into college classrooms and talk about this, and they want to chase me out with a stick. <laughs> they love them some Amazon. Really important that we understand this is not the way we're going to build resiliency or sustainability for our community. So I'm going to shift gears with you uh, for a minute, and we're going to talk about the built environment. Because with Local First, I spent a whole lot of time working on the adaptive reuse of existing buildings, making sure that we can get our old building stock fully utilized. Okay, too often we're in a teardown culture. We just tear it down and we make it too cumbersome to occupy in terms of building code and we're filling up landfills. And meanwhile, there's fewer and fewer spaces that locally owned businesses can afford. And we're missing that sort of character opportunity that makes places great. So these are directly related. Now, I'm going to take you back to where you were thinking about your favorite place in the world, whether it's urban or rural. Does it look like this, maybe? Is it a tree-lined street? Does it have storefronts in it? Is there diversity? Whether it's diversity of socioeconomic status, whether it's diversity of building stock, what kind of diversity might have been there? Now, and this is just an honest question, and I, I ask people around the country this. When I asked you to envision your favorite place, did you envision an intersection with six lanes of traffic headed in either direction? <laughs> with a Coles, an Applebee's, and a Lowe's? Did you envision a sea of parking and neon signs that say sail? Anybody? I'm not putting that down. I'm merely asking if that's not what we envision as great places, then why are we building that? Okay. So what we've been able to do is to change the dialogue um, in Phoenix around, we were a teardown culture, and um, we rigidly interpreted building code at the city level, so it made it next to impossible, next to impossible for a small business to fix up an old building and get their doors open, okay? So we peeled back the layers of the onion. I had the mayor appoint me to the development advisory board. I started as a complete gadfly. Here's record store lady on the development advisory board, and they were like, who let her in here? And I worked my way up to spending four years as the vice chair of that committee overhauling the adaptive reuse program to streamline it to make it easier so that your young entrepreneurs can get their doors open, creating that vibrancy that connects people to place and creates additional jobs right here at home. And I'm proud to say that we have 85 new businesses have opened up in the downtown core since we overhauled this code. So we need to get the city thinking about the value of the older buildings because for several reasons. Because it gets the doors open to the local businesses, and don't let them tell you it's the baristas. Don't let them dismiss you. We had the head of our regional economic council one time was in the back of the room when I was talking, and he loudly went, oh, thank God. And I went, what is it? And everybody laughed. And he goes, I thought this whole time you were trying to tell me baristas were going to save Arizona's economy, you know? <laughs> no, that's not what I'm talking about. But the baristas are important, not because necessarily the baristas jobs, but because they create the kind of sense of place that makes 
people want to live there, stay there, interact there, meet with their friends, read the paper, bring their dog, whatever it might be. So we also like to talk about the changing face of work environments, okay? If you looked out and, and saw a lot of the shared spaces, a lot of places that younger people who are doing tech-related jobs, turns out they love old buildings. They really like the funky old buildings. And this is another reason we need to keep our older building stock standing. You know, uh, When Ed talked in the beginning, um, architects really are having a field day with this wave of historic preservation that is, we're now linked arms with economic development. How do we make sure that we're thinking strategically about how we're gonna save these older buildings? I just did the keynote address at the National Historic Preservation Conference in Denver, and I had a great time because I just Googled the top 20 restaurants in Denver, and guess what? Every one of them was in a funky old building. <laughs> Every one. So, I love historic preservation. And I love historic preservationists. But I gotta ask you, stop talking about the casings of the windows and stop talking about the sconce or, the, or whatever it might be and start talking about jobs and economics and what the next generation of an educated workforce wants to live in, connection to place. All of those things need to be part of the argument so they can be part of the solution about why we save older buildings. This is a list of what the next generation has told us repeatedly that they want. It's no surprise. There's a great study that just came out from the American Planning Association, and it showed that the next generation want all of these things related to that character and authenticity and sense of place. And you know who else wants this? Active boomers. Active boomers want this. That study, I, I just lit up when I saw it. This is pretty powerful. The American Planning Association just did a huge nationwide survey, and they determined that only 8% of millennials actually want to live in a suburban environment where they have to drive everywhere, 8%. But what surprised me even more, 7% of active boomers want to live in a suburban environment where they have to drive everywhere. That's a pretty powerful shift of a retiring generation in America. Wow, 7% right in there neck and neck with the millennials. Those two generations are, are helping us rethink what creates a sense of place and what, how people want to live. So what I'm talking about is leveraging the small, the small businesses to, uh, and the fine grain of communities to attract those bigger jobs. Now, too often our economic developers are just out there trying to attract companies and they're throwing money at companies to try to move them into our community without pausing and investing in creating a quality sense of place where those companies might want to be and we wouldn't have to pay them, right? What about investing in the companies that we're growing ourselves? It's not as sexy from an economic development perspective because they, they only get to count the jobs they attract. Well, who made up those rules? You can't, t remember the slide, we create two jobs and eliminate three? You can't take credit for creating those two jobs if you don't also take responsibility for the three that you eliminated. It's not fair. So investing in terms of economic development into our homegrown companies that are, they're, just by their very nature, they're more connected to our place. Somebody's not gonna come in and woo them away from you because they are a hometown company. This is where we need to be spending our time and money. And what we're talking about here is called economic gardening. Economic gardening, this isn't just something crazy Kimber made up. Economic gardening started in Colorado maybe about 15 years ago now. And it's really reevaluating the way we think of economic development. If economic development is a five pointed star, it is incubators and startups, it is business retention and business expansion, and it's business attraction. I don't know the numbers for Montana, but I can tell you in Arizona for 25 years, we spent more than 90% of our budget on business attraction. And yet, we can show time and time again that job creation, real job creation is occur occurring from small and mid-sized business expansion. 
So those other four categories, incubators, startups, business ex uh, expansion and retention, that's where real jobs are happening, and yet we're spending all of our money on business attraction because of the way we've set up our guidelines and thinking around economic development. So we are advocating that we shift money back to growing our homegrown companies, to retaining our authenticity of place. It will benefit us in a number of ways. Now, you can imagine I get a lot of pushback. I do get a lot of pushback. And not so much anymore. Uh, because more and more we're seeing study and study and study showing us that what we're talking about has legs. When the Harvard Business Review is coming out and saying think small for economic development, you got to start paying attention. So what I did is I brought out a woman uh, to uh, my downtown to talk to our city leaders about uh, old Pasadena and what they did there because quite often they'll say well, well we need these big stores to drive sales tax revenue that, That's the common line of thinking and we were able to stack up old Pasadena versus new Pasadena side by side and old Pasadena was in funky old buildings It grew organically. It was all locally owned businesses one of those great little dining and shopping districts that you might know about that you might have visited and we stacked that up dollar for dollar right next to New Pasadena, which was completely subsidized, sea of chain stores, absolutely ton of parking, all in a new built environment. And Old Pasadena still outperformed New two to one, even though their parking stinks, right? <laughs> Guess what? Turns out we're willing to park and walk a little bit for a really cool, unique experience. So those kinds of measurements have helped us put economic developers and planners in the same room. And as I look out around the country, I see more and more and more areas where we need to break down these silos and make sure that these different sectors are communicating with each other. Because if the economic developer is over there just trying to create jobs by subsidizing the Cabela's and subsidizing the Bass Pro or whatever it might be, then on the other hand, the planners are out there building that kind of environment and they're not talking about what is real economic development. They're not talking about quality of life and sense of place. We need to get them in the same room talking about a strategy for how we build great places and why local economies are so incredibly important to our places. So this study is called Older, Smaller, Better, and it got put out uh, last year by Preservation Green Lab. Again, highly recommend it because it really helps us make the case for preserving the older building stock that is used time and again by the local entrepreneurs that create the ecosystem of jobs that we all so need. In addition, they create the sort of walkable, vibrant places that we're all proud to call home. So the key findings in this study, there were a wide variety of things that came out of the study, but essentially they're making the case that when you preserve older, smaller buildings, you see more, they measured a million things, this is just a few of them, greater walkability, more jobs per block, more nightlife. You want to know how they measured cool, this is so cool, nightlife for different areas of the city? Cell phone usage on a Saturday night at 10 p.m. Jobs. Isn't that brilliant? And they created heat maps that show where all the cell phones are using and they laid that over where all their funky old buildings were and it directly aligned. Directly aligned. Super, super smart study. So using whatever per performance metrics work for your town, it's really important that you think about what works in your town. Um, in my town, I'm not going to get anywhere if I just talk about, oh, but all those creative young college students, they just, they just need jobs. It's not going to happen. I want to talk about real estate performance. I want to talk about existing jobs per block. Those are the kinds of things that resonate in my community. Know your audience, okay? My background is in the arts. And I have to, you know, I have to sort of call out my own artist friends because too often they choose the wrong argument. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've been in front of the city council and had an artist friend try to read a poem to the city council. Ah, I'm like behind the desk. Like, ah, don't do that. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. So think about your audience and what metrics you need to be measuring to make the case 
that local economies are important, that old buildings and walkability are important, and they're direct, directly related to your retention of people, your civic participation of the people who live here, consciously or subconsciously. If they love their place, they're more likely to get involved. Why do they love their place? Dig back and figure out these things and build your cases. So these are the ways that we think it's important for all of us to think about how we can build better places. Thinking more about spending your money locally. It's up to us. Think about the Amazon slide, okay? Again, you spend $10 million in America at locally owned businesses, you get 110 jobs. Spend it on Amazon, you get, you get 14 jobs. Consider that just last holiday season, Americans spent $480 billion. Just imagine if we had spent that like we wanted to create jobs, okay? The economy is not something far away that somebody's gonna fix for us. We are the economy, we just forgot. We're like in a driverless car, ah! We gotta grab the wheel. We've gotta make decisions that are best for our community and the best way we can do that is with our wallets, okay? So now I'm gonna open it up to see if you have any questions for me. Thank you very much. Woo. If there's no questions, I thought of a funny story I wanted to share. You have a question? Yes. I wanted all those people move from Chicago to London. Oh, it was the weather. Just the weather. You know, our weather is, um, most people just go, oh, it's really hot. But nine months out of the year, it is gorgeous. Like, you can play golf for those days. To answer very uh, specifically, they come because they can play golf for nine months out of the year comfortably without even, you know, no concerns whatsoever. Um, so our weather is sort of a curse um, in a way. Uh, it's, it's, it attracts a lot of people who aren't connected to our place. And so it's our job to better connect them to our place. Yes. So, um, thank you for that. That was a really a great presentation. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question that's kind of on the... Um, careful what you wish for column. Um, I come from Oakland, California, and uh, we have exactly what you're talking about. We have all the funky local food restaurants. We have all the cool you know, places to eat and get coffee. And we have Starbucks too, but you know, we have all kinds of those things. Um, and we have one of the highest rates of displacement and gentrification. Ja, I knew this was going toward gentrification, yes. So, like, yes. I, I know there's you know, you might be talking mm -hmm. about places where that's not their concern right now. Mm -hmm. But my question is about, like, what are the complementary things that you can do to actually protect the people yes. who live in those neighborhoods to create yes. those really cool neighborhoods for the people who are there? Yep. Yeah. I love it. And, and that's part <coughs> of the work that we do. So, uh, and again, I can't speak to Oakland specifically, but I can say that around the country, Deals get done behind closed doors that we don't know about that unnecessarily push people out. And so a good example would be in my city center, we've got all the big hotel chains, skyscrapers, only one of them pays property taxes. We have, I think, 11 major hotel chains in our downtown. One of them pays property. What does that mean? That means that all the surrounding neighborhoods' property taxes are going up to subsidize those hotels from coming in, and that's the kind of indirect pressure that gets put on neighborhoods that we as community members need to educate ourselves about and put, put pressure back on that. In addition, the development community. A lot of times when cities own land and they put it out for a request for proposals for development for housing, there's not enough requirement on there that really would benefit the neighborhood. For example, most people go to uh, affordability, and that's 80% of the battle, but the other 20% is critical. We've got to be able to have things like um, commercial kitchen on the ground floor of a new development that serves three to 500 square foot suites that support entrepreneurs of the community. So right there in that building forevermore, they have to have small suites that are supported by a commercial kitchen that that developer had to put in to support a multicultural food opportunity on the ground floor to complement 
the affordable housing. So it's about thinking about ahead of time how we can put in requirements that will ensure affordability for the people who live there currently. And we need to elect people who are not so caught up on, um, oh, you want to build something in our downtown? How much do you have to pay you? We've got it wrong, right? <laughs> We've got that equation wrong, and we need to be having that conversation. We're having a lot of battles in Phoenix right now for Giplet, which is you know, offsetting of uh, taxes for developers. And at some point, we have to say, if you want to build, we want to attract the right people to build here who want to add to our neighborhood, not displace it. And so all of those conversations, unfortunately, happen long before. So by the time you see gentrification, sometimes it's too late to reverse it. And that, that's really painful. But we, we need to be very proactive about those conversations around policy that leads us to the same thing over and over again, which is displacement. So thank you for asking that. Yeah. Who else? Um, I'm sure you ran into, sure you ran into the issue of bringing in local businesses downtown. Um, that's something that my company's been looking at doing. Part of the problem is logistics, um, warehouse space. Um, have you had any solutions where you've um, worked with a company that requires a lot of logistics for material? Um, what do you mean requires logistics for material? Well, most of our business is storing the material, but we have a design showroom. So um, a downtown facility wouldn't work for us because of that fact. I want to make sure I understand your question. So you're, you're working in the built environment, but you're talking about literally showing that to the public? We have a design showroom. Okay. Um, but most of our product comes in weekly and requires a lot of space. Yes. Um, but downtown necessarily doesn't have those options. Um, it would be quite industrial. Right. It wouldn't work for us or our customers. Right. Well, I have had work. I have had experience working in that. And the, the first thing that comes to my mind is we have a mattress manufacturer that just moved downtown, um, and they put a showroom just in the front of it and left the warehouse in the back. But they took over a big funky building, and the showroom is just in the front where you can go in and check out their mattresses. Um, and it's actually a really modern looking thing. And then they actually make them on site in the back. But it's not something they're trying to get the public to walk around back there. And I'm not sure if that really helps you. So in terms of a showroom where you need a lot of space, that, that, that does get really complicated because you are, new construction would be way too expensive for that mm -hmm. to bring it in. So I don't, I don't have any better example. I'm sorry about that. Oh, I appreciate it. Yeah, Thanks. yeah. I'm gonna, sh oh, one more over here, yes. Is there some kind of fulcrum <coughs> thing that needs to happen first before other things can happen? You know, that's the story of my life. It feels that way. <laughs> it feels that way. Um, but I really think that it comes down to um, th that starting point is for people to pause and evaluate the things that are most important to them and what they love and, and what they're trying to achieve. What, what is their sense of purpose? Um, what things in their community do they value the most? And so sometimes it's literally a facilitated conversation to bring out of that community because sometimes we just get in the mad dab, you know, I mean, think about how much over the last 25 years we've been barraged with saving money. Save money. Save money, live better. Save money. We've forgotten what that means. We just know we're supposed to do it, right? We are so disconnected that we've forgotten about what's important, which leads me to this final thought, and it, I, that's really the best, I, it, it's really got to come from within. Be, we're building places that nobody wants to live in because we're allowing that to happen because we didn't name what we wanted and demand what we wanted. But it lends into the, I was going to tell one final story here, which is what occurred to me uh, that ties into that. Um, and this is a true story. This guy came running up to me and he said, you know, I heard your talk and, and you really changed the way I think about the way I spend my money. And... I said, oh, you know, I'm really happy to hear that. And he said, yeah, I live in a town in Arizona. It's called Maricopa. And it, it was at one time the most upside down town in America. Uh, they, you know, in, 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 we were just growing so fast. At one time, we had 14 abandoned, half-developed subdivisions circling our city. 14 abandoned. So his uh, community was built like an erector set. You know, you just picture, you know, where they just blow up a city all of a sudden. 
And, and then when the recession hit, everybody went upside down. And he and his wife were upside down in their home, and they couldn't get out from under it. And he's relaying to me that here I was um, spending all of my money with big national brands in Phoenix, and, and at the same time getting mad at the Maricopa Town Library for shutting their hours. You know, they're closing down their hours. And, and now, you know, my trash is only going to get collected once a week. And I'm outraged. And, and all of my spending is going into the neighboring community. It never occurred to me, wait a minute, they're counting on me. And I was like, wow, I'm really glad that you had this epiphany. He goes, nobody oh, gets worse. I said, well, what is that? And he said, well, my wife and I were traveling into the west side of Phoenix every day, a huge commute, and uh, blazing through my tires. And I was going into Costco to buy my tires for my and my wife over and over in Costco in Phoenix. And I have a neighbor named Ray who has a tire shop, and I've never even been in it, right? And I was like, ooh, that's pretty bad. <laughs> and then he says, so this year I ran in, and I threw the door open. I said, Ray, I'm here to buy my tires from you because it's the right thing to do. But you're going to have to match Costco's price. <laughs> <laughs> so Ray looked up with a big smile on his face, and he said, I'm cheaper than Costco every day, you idiot, but I'd be happy to match their price. <laughs> Thank you.